but Revelation chapter 20 is where we're going to be this morning. We're going to be reading a little bit, but we're also going to be journeying, journeying through a bigger portion of Scripture this morning, talking about the topic that we introduced last week, the millennium, or the millennial reign of Christ. Now, I, I don't believe in Christianity right now. There's many more or bigger controversies than how to interpret the verses that we're reading in, in Revelation chapter 20. There's so much conflict. I spent this week on Twitter watching people go back and forth and fighting about this issue, about the millennium. Is it literal? Is it not? And so I'm going to just recap a little bit some of the different ways that people interpret the millennium and, and what it represents. Post-millennialists say that as the gospel goes out across this world and more and more people come to saving faith in Jesus, the world will become better and better and eventually improve to a utopia-like state that will get to the point where it, the, the millennium is ushered in by the church as it goes across uh, around the world, winning people to faith in Christ. And after that point, Christ will return. Our millennialists believe that the millennium is an allegory and it represents Christ's rule and reign right now as he reigns from heaven and Satan is bound spiritually. So they don't, they don't take this uh, literally. And then premillennialists like myself believe that Christ is going to return before a literal thousand year period of peace and prosperity. And that's where I have landed. But again, we've talked about this and, and Wade and I even sat down and talked about it a little bit this week and appreciated that conversation that if you land somewhere else, if you're, if you're somewhere in, in one of those camps or maybe you're somewhere else, I, I, we're gonna stress two things. We're gonna stress charity and unity. We may disagree on this topic and that is totally okay. But I'm gonna teach, I just want to be upfront and honest with you, I'm gonna teach from this premillennialist perspective. Whatever interpretation you hold to is gonna dramatically change how you read the end of the book of Revelation, how you read the book of Revelation as a whole, and then also how you interpret large sections of the Old Testament. There's a lot, there's many, many, many verses that talk about this time period in the millennium. So what lens that you use to interpret this idea of the millennium can, can change. I'm an unapologetic premillennialist, okay? So I, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you up front. This is how I'm gonna teach. I'm gonna teach this literally, and that's how I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna present things today from that hermeneutic. So I believe the millennium will be a specific period of time for humanity, a specific thousand year period. And I wanna talk about that this morning because it is so much more than I can fit into one sermon. So we're gonna power through and we're gonna look, this is gonna be an unbelievable time for humanity. So let's look at Revelation chapter 20. Let's start with the, verse, the first six verses. If you would join me there. Once you have it, I'm gonna ask you to stand to give honor to the reading of God's word. Revelation chapter 20. Verse one, I know we covered this last week, but I wanna put it into context where we are talking about today. It says then, so then, then means something happened and then this, what just happened? Look back at the end of 19. The beast, yes, the beast and the false prophet cast into the lake of fire, why? I know you all are saying it. I know I hear your whispers. So Christ returned to earth. The beast gathered an army to fight against him at the battle of Armageddon. The armies of the Antichrist were destroyed. The beast and the false prophet were cast into hell. And now we see this. Then, verse one, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key to the abyss. The abyss is not hell. We, we want to be clear about that. It is, it is a place, a demonic place for where demons have, have been uh, incarcerated. So it says, he is holding the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seized whom? The dragon, who is whom? That ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, into this kind of demonic prison, closed it, put a seal on it so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. And after that, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones and people seated on them who were given authority to judge. And I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God 
these people, it says, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for how long? A thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. We're going to talk about this next week, but this rest of the dead, these are unbelievers. These are people who are about to face judgment in, this, in the next section. So it says they did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in this first resurrection. I'm going to be real clear this morning, church. I'm going to preach before we've even finished. This is you. He's talking about you. If you have put your faith, your saving faith in Jesus Christ, one day our earthly bodies will die and we will be raised to new life just like Jesus was. That's what this is talking about. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in this first resurrection. The second death, it's talking about hell, has no power over them. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and they will reign with him for how long? A thousand years. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray this is, as we enter into the study of your word, we, we understand that there are many interpretations of this. And, and we submit to the fact that our human minds struggle sometimes understanding. But you have promised the Holy Spirit in us to testify about Jesus and to lead us into deeper understandings. And so I pray that you would, like 1 Corinthians says, that, that natural man can't understand the things of God, but we are not. We, we are born of the Spirit if we believed in Jesus. And I, I pray this morning that, Lord, your, your Spirit himself would enlighten us and open our eyes and open our hearts to understand what you have. And I pray that in the end, we would have charity and unity. I pray even as we disagree, that we can agree on this, that you will reign for all eternity and we will enjoy your presence. Father, I thank you and I praise you for who you are, for what you have done, and for the word that you've given us. I pray that in this moment, you would push me to the side. Lord, I, I don't want to get in the way of, of, of your word. I pray that you would use your word this morning to transform to build up, to edify your people. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's move through this passage, and we're going to move through a bunch of other passages as well. Let's talk about this a little bit this morning. I want to see first how this passage flows, and that's why I wanted to read the first three verses before we jumped into uh, verses four through six. What's the first thing that happens here in verses one through three? Give me a, just one, one word or one sentence synopsis. What happens? The dragon is sealed up. Satan is bound. We've got to understand the millennium. To understand really what's going to happen, we've got to understand that for Satan is bound so that he would no longer deceive the nations. His influence is removed. And this is key because humanity has felt Satan's influence since the very beginning. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the very first thing, God says you may eat from all of the trees in the garden. I've given all of this to you as this bountiful provision for you. There's just one tree you can't eat from. And what did Adam and Eve do? They ate. Man, we're, I talk about in, in heaven wanting to talk to people. I, I want to talk to uh, m some of my heroes in, in the scripture. I want to talk about like, some of my heroes in the faith. But man, I want to I have a word with Adam and Eve. And, and I say that with reverence, but man, the one thing, but let's, let's ask this question. Read, you and I, or, or read and I don't know who else, who's here? Casey, read and Casey, you're Adam and Eve, you're in the garden. Given the same opportunity, given the same circumstances, given the same choice, what are you guys going to do? Eat the fruit? Read, Why? <laughs> Come on, I, I, I love that to you. No, I'm just kidding. That, that's what we would have done. That's, that's who we are as humans. Our, our hearts are inevitably and, and completely bent toward that choice, toward rebellion. And so from the very beginning, but here's the thing, when we see here in Revelation chapter 20, remove Satan from the scenario. Remove his influence from this earth. 
and we're going to see a very, very different situation. His lies, his temptations, his work, his influence, all of it, bound up and sealed for a thousand years. This is a game changer. This changes everything. It frees up the earth to be exactly what God originally intended it to be. And in fact, we see throughout the scripture, we see that the earth will be restored to this place like the Garden of Eden again. It's like God hit rewind and he went back and placed us in this perfect place. No rebellion, no shame, no guilt, no blame. It'll be an incredible paradise on earth. I, I, I'm going to talk about this quite a bit this morning. But I just want to pause for a second and give God praise. This is what he's prepared for us, church. This is what he's prepared for us. And I know that we deal with a lot of junk. I know this week there's been stuff on your plate and there's been stuff that has come through your life that you wish hadn't been there. I know that there's stuff that made you weary. I know that there's stuff that made you angry. I know that there's things that happen in our lives and we just, we think, what, what? we just gotta keep dealing with this. It just keeps bigger and bigger and the situations get worse and worse and all these things are happening. But listen, rejoice. This is what God has prepared for his people. He's preparing this for us. The earth is gonna be restored to a state of purity and perfection like the Garden of Eden. It's gonna be an incredible paradise. Now men have tried to create this kind of utopia for, since the beginning, right? We've wanted to create utopia. In fact, that word utopia was coined by Sir Thomas More who wrote a book called Utopia in 1516. He envisioned this, this country that would be perfect. There'd be no war, there'd be uh, no, no famine, no poverty, there'd be no property. Everybody would just share everything, no classes. We'd all just get along and we'd share everything and everything would be perfect and wonderful and amazing. That was 500 years ago. And men have tried and tried and tried to create that. Have they been successful? Has there been a utopian country? Absolutely not. Uh, let's aim smaller. Let's set the bar real low. Has there been a utopian city? They've tried. They, they, they've tried. In fact, in my lifetime, there's been several planned utopian cities in states like Montana and in different places where they try to gather people together, but it never worked. Let's aim even lower. Has there been a utopian family or a utopian household? Is your house perfect? Do your kids wake up smiling and they say, I'm so grateful to live in your home, I'm so grateful for what you provide? And you walk around and, and it's just, there's everywhere you go, every room you enter, there's music. And people get along, and you walk in, and your kids are hugging each other, and you didn't even force them. Isn't that how your house goes? Exactly. That's right. Exactly the opposite. But here's the thing. Governments have tried to create it. People have tried to create this perfect place, this utopia, but it can't exist where sin and Satan remain. It's not possible. Where sin is internal and Satan is external, we can't have a perfect utopia. So Thomas More, he was one of the first advocates of, of what we call socialism today, utopian socialism, and it just doesn't work because at the heart of who we are, we're motivated by sin and by greed. We can't create perfection, but remove Satan from the equation and remove sin from the equation. And church, what do you get? You get utopia. You get a different kind of world. That's what we're reading about here in Revelation 20. Something unprecedented. Something totally new and, and totally different. This is as God intended this earth to be from the beginning. So I'm going to ask a few questions from this text and then from all of Scripture this morning as we're going to go through this. And this will be our outline. Number one, who will be there? Number two, what will it be like? And number three, what will we be doing? Who will be there? What will it be like? What, and what will we be doing? Number one, who will be there? Right off the bat, we don't even have to go to Scripture. We know this for a fact. First person that will be there is God. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, right now, we enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit. That when Jesus ascended to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit as our comforter, as our advocate, as, as the, the, the dweller of the temple of our bodies. He is here with us. But there in the millennium, we will have God's physical presence. We'll have Jesus himself reigning from a throne. In all his glory and perfection, he will physically inhabit this earth again. We'll see him, not by faith, but with our very eyes. So he's going to be with his people. So the first thing, first person that is there is God. The second group of people will say from here on out. Look back at Revelation 20, verse 4. 
I saw thrones and people seated on them who were given authority to judge. Church, these are resurrected believers who return with Christ at the second coming. This is you and me. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, one day you will come back with Christ in his second coming and you will sit on a throne and give an authority to judge. This is you and me. We'll be given our resurrection body. This is amazing. I, I, it's, it's hard for me even to, to contain myself in talking about this because there's so many times, I, when I was in my teens and 20s, life was super easy. I no responsibilities, really. I just kind of went through life and I could eat whatever I wanted and it'd be fine. I, I'd go through life and I never gained weight and then I hit 30. I was like, what, what in the world? What happened? And you're looking at me like, yeah, something happened. Something, <laughs> something happened. We need to talk about what, what happened there. But seriously, in, in this in this millennial time period in these resurrected bodies be free from pain from problems from uh, the, the detriments of what it means to live in a corrupt world the bodies that won't suffer decay bodies that won't age bodies that won't uh, suffer illness all these amazing things i had one pastor and he was really fixated on that in seminary and he said this you can eat as much as you want in the millennium and never gain weight he was really fixated on that and now I understand, I'm like, that, if that is, I can't theologically point that out in scripture, but if that's the, if that's the, man, I'm, I'm going to really super enjoy that. But we'll be there, church, we'll be given the resurrection bodies that we were intended to be free from pain, free from problems, free from getting up in the morning and saying, ah, oh, my back, free from all of these things, free from the curse of sin. So this is us sitting on thrones. It also says the third group of people I saw also in verse four. I saw thrones, people seated on them. And then it says, I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God, who had not worshiped the beast or his image, who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. These are the martyrs who lost their life during the tribulation. During those seven years of tribulation, these are the tribulation martyrs. These are the ones who refused to bow down to the Antichrist and they were beheaded, they were killed because of their faith. They're given new life, and they're resurrected to be with Jesus. The fourth and fifth groups of people, we're gonna to have to look outside of Revelation 20, but we're gonna see them all through scripture. First, the believers who survive the tribulation. Who survive the tribulation. Now, I wanna make this real clear, I need, to, I need to stop and focus here. The only people that will enter the millennium are believers in Jesus Christ. At the end of the Battle of Armageddon, there's many, many millions of people still left. And it says in Revelation 19, 21, that all unbelievers were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of the rider and the horse. That was their last moment. That was the last opportunity to come to faith in Jesus Christ. So coming into the millennium, I believe that people who managed to survive those seven years of tribulation but who had placed their faith in Jesus, I believe that they will go into the millennial reign of Christ. An example would be in Revelation chapter 14, the 144,000 Jewish believers who are sealed and redeemed. Jesus also talks about Gentile believers entering into the time of the millennium in Matthew chapter 25. So I believe that people will go into the millennium alive. Now, fifth group of people, and this is where we're gonna get a little controversial. Can we do that? We can, we can just talk about some, some controversy that happens. I believe that the people who go alive into the tribulation, who survive, or into the millennium who survive the tribulation, I believe that they will be able to procreate and have children. So I believe that they will, they will exist and, and be able to have children. Isaiah chapter 11 talks about infants, toddlers, and little children. So I believe if you take that literally, now I'm applying a literal hermeneutic across all of scripture, but you see this, I, I believe that many more children will be born during this period. Now, this is something that many people also disagree with. So uh, I'm not, I'm, this is not something I'm going to make a hill that I'm going to die on. But this is, from looking at scripture, this is what I believe. So this is who will be there. You imagine, just let's recap real quick. Who is going to be there? God himself is going to dwell with humanity. Believers who have, who have passed on and have been resurrected to new bodies, they'll be there. The martyrs who died during the tribulation will be there. Those who survived the tribulation will be there. And then also the children of those. It's a big group of people. And we're all gathered together around one main character 
who's been the main character of the book of Revelation and been the main character of all human history. Who is it? It's, it's, it's God. It's, it's Jesus in this, uh, in, in this situation. But we understand now we live in a time where we, that, that Christ and Father are in heaven and the Holy Spirit is here on earth. So that's, that's who's going to be there. Now let's talk about number two, what it will be like. What is it going to be like? Has anybody been, I, I know uh, like uh, Brittany, you guys just got back from some amazing places. You guys went to the Virgin Islands and, and different places like that. Uh, give me three words that describe your experience. I'm going to put you on the spot. Beautiful. Windy. Two is sufficient. Beautiful, beautiful and windy. But have you ever guys ever, you ever been to a place? And maybe it holds memories for you. Maybe you went on vacations there and, and you sat there or you, or you, you were lying in a hammock or you're looking at, sitting in a recliner and you just thought, I could stay here forever. Man, so growing up, my family would go to a, a place literally called Paradise in Michigan. Paradise, Michigan. It's just right across um, the, the Mackinac Bridge in the Upper Peninsula. And I remember we went there every summer. My family has a home there and, and all that. But I just remember even as a kid and even now longing to go back to paradise, you know, longing to go back and you just sit there and you think, I, I could stay here forever. So I, I want to talk about what this millennial time period will be like. This is where I had so much trouble in this sermon today, editing, editing. There are hundreds of verses scattered throughout the Bible that talk about what the millennium is going to be like. Entire chapters in Isaiah and Ezekiel talk about it. So just filtering through was a really fun and exciting and difficult challenge just to, to kind of condense things down to a place that we can understand in one single sermon. But I want to I talk about what life will be like in the millennium. I have two passages. I want to read for you two short passages that I think kind of encompass everything all together. I'm going to read these for you. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. It says this, The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf, the young lion, and the fattened calf will be together, and a child will lead them. I'm going to keep reading, but what, is, what does this mean so far? What does it mean to you? Not to you. What does it mean? If a wolf and a lamb dwelt together, something would have to change in this world, right? If, if, if a leopard could lie down with a goat, something would have to change. If a child could lead a young lion and a fattened calf, well, what, what does this mean about this earth? Peace. That's a great way to say it. It says, the cow and the bear will graze, the young ones will lie down together, and a lion will eat straw like a cattle. Like cattle. An infant will play beside the cobra's pit. Does that make any parents a little uncomfortable to hear that phrase? I, I, it just, that always gets me. Gets me a pit in my stomach. And a toddler will put his hand into the snake's den. They will not harm or destroy each other in my entire holy mountain, for the land will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is filled with water. What an amazing picture of this earth at peace. Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 26 through 28. says, I will make them and the area around my hill a blessing. I will send down showers in their season, and they will be showers of blessing. The trees of the field will yield their fruit, and the land will yield its produce. My flock will be secure in their land, and they will know that I am the Lord. They will live securely, and no one will frighten them. What does that tell you about life in the millennium? Thriving, productive. Every time you put your hands in the soil to garden, you're going to pull up abundance of fruit and, and vegetables and different things will live secure in the land. I, I think all of the other passages in some way kind of highlight what those two passages talk about. And I want to talk, let's go all the way back to the beginning, because we don't live in this world now, right? I, I mean, so we're sitting in here, uh, how many of you guys want to volunteer to just to try this out, uh, to put your child's hand in a snake's den? Which... <laughs> Legitimate question. 
Very good. And Ross, I did see your hand raised. So we do have a volunteer. He volunteers as tribute. Obviously, we're not going to do that. Why? Because we live in a broken world. We live in a world of real and dangerous consequences. And it all came from that one decision. From Adam and Eve looking and saying, I want what the serpent promises and what my flesh desires more than what God has offered and promised me. It says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, God is cursing Adam for, for what he's done. And it says, the ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground since you were taken from it. For you are dust and you will return to dust. That is a description of what life is like. <laughs> Three things that we see in that text. Number one, the earth will be hostile. That's what God promises to, to Adam because of his sin. The earth is going to be hostile. Two, survival will be difficult. And three, life will end in death. That's the reality that we live in. That's why we don't stick our hand in a cobra's den. That's why the bear and the leopard and, and the, the lamb and, and the fattened calf can't dwell together in peace because of those three things. The earth is hostile, survival is difficult, and life will end in death. But in the millennium, remove this, this, the curse from the scenario, remove Satan from the scenario, remove sin from the lives of people. Each of those components are reversed. So we see this, the earth will no longer be dangerous or hostile. We read that in Isaiah chapter 11. Animals will dwell together. The, the lion will eat straw like, a, like cattle. We know we will not have to fight to survive. Survival will not be difficult. It says that the earth is going to yield up its produce. It's going to yield up sustenance and provision for us. We'll dwell securely. And then also, death is not on the horizon. That's the biggest promise. We'll never have to deal with it again. Never have to deal with the sting of grief and, and the bitterness of, of, of putting uh, somebody that we love into the ground. We'll never have to deal with that again. That's the, that's the millennium. I, I went to some commentaries about it to kind of see what people say, if they could add something. And theologians and commentators, they went absolutely nuts about the millennium. They, they, this topic is, is huge. John MacArthur talks about life, peace, joy, righteousness, and prosperity. David Jeremiah adds holiness, happiness, and purity. And then the flagship book on the end times is a book by Dwight Pentecost called Things to Come. And he wrote 100 pages on the millennium. And as I read through, it just gives, it, it, it made my heart beat inside my chest. Lord, this is, the, this is the world that you have intended for us. This is the future that you have promised. And this is what, what Dwight Pentecost adds. He, he talks in his book, about comfort, justice, healing, protection, unity, worship, and knowledge during the millennial reign of Christ. I, I, can't, I can't describe this to you enough. This is going to be an incredible, incredible time. Everything we do, we will thrive. Everything that we see will be a, a moment of joy. This is earth at its best and mankind at its greatest potential. And I want to give you one crazy reminder in the midst of all of this. This isn't heaven. This is, this is a preview. This is a glimpse of what's to come. Heaven is going to be so much better. We're going to be existing in the millennium, and we're going to say, there's no way it could get any better than this. This is amazing. Everything we do is, we're thriving. This is, this is exactly what we were created for. And God says, you haven't seen anything yet. This is just a glimpse. This is the appetizer. This is the chips and salsa before the enchiladas are coming out, right? It's going to be something so much better. I love this promise. Believers, this is what God has in store for you. Salvation is not just about fixing your life. It's not just, we talk about this like, oh, if I get saved, then, then my life will improve. Listen, it's, nothing is about this life. This life is so temporary. It's just... I, I, it's, it's one moment. God has prepared an eternity for you that will be blessing on top of blessing on top of blessing for those who trust in Jesus as their Savior. He's prepared wonderful things for his people. I want to encourage you with that. I know you're dealing with stuff. I know that each and every day you open the news and you say, how, how could it get worse than this? And then the next day you think, okay, that's how. It got, it got a little bit worse every single day. But this is what God's prepared for his people. We're saved with this in mind that one day we'll stand before Christ 
And he'll ask you that question. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Have you trusted in Jesus as your Savior? And if you have, you'll enter into an eternity of joy in the presence of God. So we've talked about who's going to be there. We've talked about what it's going to be like. I want to end with this. What will we be doing? What will we be doing? What's it going to be? Uh, what, what are we going to do there? Are we just going to hang around all day worshiping the Lord? Are we just going to sit with our little harps plunking out, plunking out little worship songs for all of eternity? Do we, do we get a life? Do we get to talk to people? Or is it just, is it just worship 24-7? Listen, angels were created for worship 24-7. God has angels circling his throne that cry out without ceasing 24 hours a day for all eternity that he is holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. We were created for something more. You and I will be given responsibilities to take care of. If the earth during the millennium is like the Garden of Eden, then it begs this question, what was Adam doing in the garden before the sin? Not rhetorical. He was a caretaker. He was working. He was doing something. Genesis 2.15 says, the Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to watch over. Mankind was created to work. And you're like, man, I, I spent my whole life working, and now I have, to, I have to go to heaven and work too? I have to go to the millennium and work too? But here's the difference between labor and work now and labor in the millennium is remove the debilitating effects of sin. He says, we just read it a little bit ago in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. Painful labor. That's what we experience now, painful labor. Remove painful, and what do you get? Labor. It's not a trick question. You get labor. Fulfilling, worshipful, intentional, rewarding labor. This is what we were created for. We're not created in laziness. We're not created to sit and watch the world go by. We're created with responsibilities, and that's what we're going to be doing. There's things that we're going to be doing. I'm going to give you just a, a few so that you can kind of get a picture of this. The first thing, right from our text in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, I saw thrones and people were seated on them. So we'll be reigning and governing. The uh, Bible also says at the end of verse 4, it says, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And then at the end of verse 6 as well, it says they will reign with him for a thousand years. We'll be given authority to judge. We'll be reigning. People will be kings, administrators, judges, people of authority. They'll reign with him. Jesus told his disciples in Luke chapter 22, verse 30, you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Obviously, we reign with limited authority. Nobody's going nobody's gonna to reach the top. Nobody's going to become king of the world. Why? Because Christ himself is reigning. He's sitting on a throne with a rod of iron reigning on this earth. So we'll reign, be reigning with limited authority beneath him. So we'll reign and govern. The second thing, and this kind of encompasses everything, but we'll be serving the Lord. We'll be serving the Lord. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. At the end of it, it says, the second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ. We will be serving our king. Everything that we do will be an act of service to our king. Every breath that we take will glorify his name. Everything that we do will be in service to him like the, like the priests in the Old Testament. They minister before the Lord. They serve the Lord, and that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be serving him as he rules. We're going to work for his glory, complete his objectives, be sent on his missions, and do what he asks of us. All this in service to our King. Third thing, and I'm going to be really, really vague here, and then we're going to kind of give some, some more insight. We're going to be working and laboring. Working and laboring. I know it's hard to picture working and laboring without sweat and strain and stress and the debilitating effects of sin, but debilitating effects of sin. But this is, we're going to be given responsibilities. The Bible talks about these things in the Old Testament, that there will be rulers Judges, administrators, students, scholars, navigators, shipbuilders, farmers, shepherds, fishermen, landscapers, stonemasons, metalworkers, singers, and musicians. There, there's abundance of opportunities to use gifts that God has given and to do things that he's called us to do without labor, 
without pain, without limitation, without sweat, without failure. Everything you do is going to succeed. All of it is for God's glory. We're going to be doing something. There's going to be a a time for you. If you say, man, I've always wanted to learn how to garden. Maybe this is your opportunity, a thousand-year master class in in how to garden. Mindy and I have tried so hard. Church, y'all don't even know. We have tried so hard. We have put blood, sweat, and tears into the very earth only to have it grow weeds in our faces. We have killed every plant that we've ever owned. Now, Mindy's done really good lately about keeping plants alive. I'm really impressed and also jealous, and I don't want to talk about it anymore. But it says during the millennium, it says that that, that crops will yield their fruit, that trees will grow. Everything you do will be successful. There'll be no limitations. If you don't understand it, you'll have the capacity, the unlimited capacity to understand it and to figure it out. All of this for God's glory. I'm done, church. I know it's 1116. Rejoice. If I have one word for you this morning, I know that you're going off from a a tough week, probably into a tough week. But listen, my word for you, take this home. Rejoice. Take comfort in what awaits you as a child of God. Are you exhausted from work this week? Are you tired? One day you will work without sweat, stress, or strain. You'll be ultimately, eternally fulfilled. Are you, are you physically struggling? How many people are, are dealing with some kind of crud, some kind of cold, some kind of allergies? Nobody wants to admit it because they're like, the people next to me might complain. No, we are. And every, everybody's sick. How about this? Are you mentally or emotionally just exhausted, depleted? Well, one day, your resurrection body will be perfect and you won't feel pain or weariness. And you'll be exactly as God intended you to be. How about this? Are are you spiritually depleted? Have you been praying for something or for someone for a really long time and it just doesn't seem like God is listening to you? Well, one day in this time period, in the millennium, you won't have to pray. You'll be able to go straight to the throne of Jesus himself and he'll welcome you to his side and you can stay there as long as you want. The millennium is going to be an incredible, wonderful time of peace and joy and prosperity and blessing. It's a sweet taste of glory in heaven to come but it's only reserved for those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. If you have never made that decision to repent of your sin, to turn your back on your sin, and to trust in Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity this morning. Praise team, I'm going to ask you to come. We do this every single week, but the purpose of our invitations is not just to see people come and pray at the altar. The, The purpose is not to see how many people we can do it. The purpose is to give you an opportunity to respond. That's, that's the pattern that we see in Scripture, that the Word is preached and that the people respond. And you can respond where you are. You can sit, you can sit there, you can sing a response of joy. You can, you can stand and you can pray and thank the Lord for what He's prepared for you. But if you're sitting here this morning and God's been dealing with your heart about this decision that you've never trusted in Jesus, you've never had a moment where you've turned your back on your sin and trusted in the sacrifice that Jesus made for you on the cross, you've never done that. Don't waste this time of uh, of invitation and response. Come and talk to me. Thomas and I are going to be at the front. We would love to to sit down and explain what it means because we know, we've talked about this all morning, that we are broken by sin and cursed by sin. But Jesus came for this reason, to take that curse on himself, to be stricken down by God, to be punished for your sin and my sin so that when we come to him and trust and believe in what he did and believe in him, He offers us the eternal gift of salvation through his sacrifice. This morning, if you haven't made that decision, I would love to talk to you. I'm not going to pressure you. I'm not a used car salesman. This is God's work. It's not my work. But if you want more information, I'm here. I want to pray with you. I would love to explain with you. I would love to do whatever it takes to help you understand what that means. If you want to join the church, come and, and, and grab a membership card and fill that out this morning and make it known that you would like to enter into this time of membership respond in some way, whether it's in prayer where you are, whether it's in praise, or whether it's in uh, responding in, in giving your life to Christ and in, in responding to the gospel, or whether it's joining the church, whatever it may be. Uh, use this opportunity to respond. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. You are good and holy and righteous and glorious. And we are so excited, Lord, that you've prepared an eternity for us that surpasses our wildest imaginations. Thank you, Lord, for loving us to that degree. I pray that if somebody in this room has been going through the motions and they've been going to church, but they 
haven't, Lord, been wrecked by your spirit, if they haven't been reminded and confronted with their sin and their need for a savior, and they haven't made that decision to trust in Jesus alone, I pray this morning that they would make that, 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 that crucial, life-changing decision. I pray that your spirit would lead them in that way. Father, we love you and we thank you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray.